good, af good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the Extraordinary Technology Conference 2015, or 17, rather. Gee, I'm traveling through time already. Um, we uh, are going to have the privilege today to hear from another conference staple. He's been coming here for a number of years. He's presented with John Cyril and has some amazing, uh, amazing research to present to us today. He's spearheading the work of John Cyril, and he's going to be speaking on beam ships, the Byfield Brown effect, and warp drive. And guess what? As we just found out, he can sing too. Please give a warm welcome to Russell Anderson. Oh, thanks, Vern. How's everybody doing? Well, we have a lot of material to go over in a very short time. It always goes way, way too fast. It's 4.03 now. I will try to stop on time. Uh, this is from January 12th, the New York Times, the famous New York Times. January 12th, 1929, the year of the great stock market crash. Einstein extends relativity theory. New work seeks to, quote, unite laws of field of gravitation and electromagnetism. And then Einstein supported. This is from April... 28th, 1955, the year of Einstein's death, unified field theory partly confirmed by physicists. April 27th, Dr. Parvis Murat, University of Maryland physicist, reported today that he has partly confirmed the late Albert Einstein's famous unified field theory, and it was published January 10th, 1929, in Annalender Physik, a Prussian science journal, and it was called Zur Einheitlichen Feld Theory, or the Unified Field Theory for Gravitation and Electricity, and that was written in high German and and it combines uh, magnetism, electricity, electromagnetism, and gravitation into a single expression. But anyway, um, let's get down to business. See if uh, I can get that slide, first slide to come up. There we go. Beam ships, the V-field Brown effect, and warp drive. Any force field propulsion system is warp drive because if you've read any of Leonard G. Cramp's work, uh, his books, Peace for a Jigsaw, or UFOs and Anti-Gravity. Uh, any force field propulsion is warp drive because inertial mass has been canceled by the field. Everything within the field, including payload and passengers, moves at the same rate. So it's technology for our survival as a subtitle because, God forbid, we ever had a tremendous natural disaster like an asteroid strike or a Yellowstone caldera going up. We want to be able to have a method for getting off the planet and maybe getting to Mars or some survival colonies or getting to uh, perhaps Alpha Centauri 4 or some other uh, habitable planet that's we're, planets that we're finding around some of the great main sequence stars. Anyway, what you see there is the P11 with a retractable walkway and uh, kneeling landing legs like a kneeling bus. You have to have the ship up off the ground as far as you can get it before it takes off or uh, if you're over grass it'll take up a chunk, a big chunk of sod up uh, electrostatically and just stick to the bottom of the disc. You don't want that. Anyway, here we go. I'm going to click to the next slide here. Now, those are what are called by aliens who look exactly like us from the direction of the star cluster Pleiades beam ships or ray ships, they use the terms uh, interchangeably, because uh, in antiquity, 22 million years ago, uh, the purported home of many of Homo sapiens that inhabit this planet right now, there was a war in ancient Lyra, they escaped to Earth, found Earth 22 million years ago. The first, very first drive that enabled them to travel between the stars was a light emitting drive and later they changed to the electromagnetic drive and the ship needed that shape, this uh, circular disk shape and you see a uh, man craft on top and a drone ship, a radio controlled drone ship on the bottom. You see three condenser spheres on the bottom. Those are main drive and attitude control units. And uh, here's another photo from a film. And if any of you guys have bought uh, what I had on the table, I got two left of the beam ship kit videos or any of the beam ship kits, you have the video that has the films of these beam ships flying in Swiss airspace, which is really incredible. Uh, this has all been checked by the computer, both old and new technology, pixel enhancements. People in ILM in California uh, can't understand how these shots were accomplished because the computer and all their technology shows that these are 
seven meter craft, large objects, some distance from the camera, not CGI, not Photoshop. And there's one of my beam ships. That's the six foot diameter beam ship variation three, hovering my apartment in southeastern Pennsylvania. That's about uh, 42 grams in weight, and it's flying with about 47 watts. That's about uh, 40,000 volts. The commercial power supply, whoops, commercial power supply is right there. And that's about 40,000 volts, current limited to 1.5 milliamps right there. And uh, there are thin wires, stainless steel wires, anode on top, stainless steel, just simple kitchen foil, and uh, positive on top, anode on top, cathode on the bottom. The cathode is your ship hull. And through electrostatic attraction and having these uh, electrodes in fixed relationship, off you go. The most efficient form of propulsion known to man. Horse and buggy to starship. That's uh, somewhere in my home state of Pennsylvania, southeastern Pennsylvania, Amish. Or would you prefer this mode of transport? This, is, this one's a little primitive, a little stinky. This is clean, noiseless, anywhere in the universe. What is electrogravitics? Well, the proposed propulsion technology will replace the energy-intensive rocket technology presently used for propelling spacecraft. The technology called electrogravitics has already been developed in black, quote-unquote, defense research programs, programs so highly classified that their existence is not publicly acknowledged. Electrogravitics may appear to violate certain assumptions about gravity commonly held by physicists and aeronautical engineers, so the reader is requested to keep an open mind. The technology does exist, has been under development for the past 40 years, well, actually longer than that, past 80 years, and has been shown to be feasible both in carefully controlled laboratory experiments and in actual test flights actual test flights of manned and unmanned craft. Basically, electrovitics is a technology that allows a spacecraft to artificially alter its own gravity field in such a manner that it is able to levitate itself. This is accomplished by applying a megavolt pulsed, and pulsing is very important, we'll talk about that in a few minutes, DC electric potential across the outer hull and wing of the spacecraft. The craft would be designed to have a relatively large body surface area, similar to the flying wing concept employed in the B-2 Spirit Bomber. Alternately, it could be discoidal in shape with a lenticular cross-section. Think of the terminus of a high-voltage uh, Tesla coil or Van de Graaff or the top of Wardenclyffe Tower for a uh, spacecraft shape. Thrust would always be in the direction of the craft's positively charged surface or an external pole, and it just chases that external positive pole into infinity as long as the charge is maintained. To quote a February 1956 Air Force intelligence report now declassified, such a craft can, quote, perform the function of a classic lifting surface. It produces a pushing effect on the undersurface and a suction effect on the upper. But unlike the airfoil, it does not require a flow of air to produce the effect. And the payoff is the value of this technology is that the craft may achieve Earth orbit at a much lower velocity. You know, when you lift off from Earth from uh, anywhere up to orbit, you get there in about two or three minutes. It's, you know, really fast acceleration. Uh, anyway, without huge fuel, without rocket propulsion, Newtonian fuel expelling reaction mass, don't have to do that with this. There's no noise, no sonic boom. We'll talk about that. Uh, it would eliminate the hazard of polluting the Earth's atmosphere, stratosphere, and space environment with aluminum oxide sphericals, which has become an increasing problem with the uh, solid rocket boosters currently in use. The fuel requirements for electrolytic propulsion are less than 1%, less than 1%, how about that, presently used to lift the space shuttle. Well, the space shuttle has been retired. It's 1950s and 60s technology. Problems typically encountered with the space shuttle's rocket propulsion technology, e.g. liquid hydrogen leaks, exhaust leaks, uh, 14 dead astronauts uh, and on takeoff and re-entry. Not good, not safe. Um, anyway, electrogravitics is the way to go. And there's George S. Piggott with his force field propulsion system. That's a, uh, whoops, that's a uh, specially designed electrostatic machine under CO2 atmosphere, several atmospheres of pressure to raise the current level. There's the terminus, the force field projector and there are some silver balls weighing several grams, I think probably weighing more than that. Uh, they're pretty heavy. And it's uh, levitating non-metallic items too. There's a conductive plate on the ground. Um, after a while, I could remove that, uh, remove that and stuff still flew. Incredible. There's a speed regulator. All this is very familiar if you know about high voltage uh, units 
and whoops, wrong button. And there we go. There's some uh, particulars about the force field device. You can check this out online. Just uh, Google or Bing search George S. Piggott, 1904. 1904, turn of the 20th century, force field propulsion. Has there been progress since 1904 in force field propulsion? Oh, yes, I would think so. And there's Tesla's flying cigar. Nikola Tesla was one of the first people to come up with the uh, concept of an all-electric aerospace craft with no moving parts. And they could either have an onboard power system, like an electrostatic generator, or beam to the ship through the Tesla's Wardenclyffe Tower, which was destroyed shortly uh, after World War I. And uh, Dnieper had World War I era, World War I era, electrogravitics, 100 years ago. New York Times, 19 September, 1917, just about 100 years ago. Professor tells of electrical tests turning attraction into repulsion because when we get further into uh, subquantum kinetics, we find that gravitation can have a repulsive effect as well as an attractive effect. And in the Searle effect generator that I am now the director of research for, we see that uh, above a certain superconducting level, gravity is a repulsive force instead of an attractive force. And basically, it's impossible to hold it down. Uh, we have a new gravitation theory, that's subquantum kinetics, highly recommend uh, P.A. Violette's, uh, La Violette's work, and any of his books, just get them in Barnes & Noble. Um, Professor Nieper made his experiments with bodies suspended horizontally toward each other. By introducing electricity to the atmosphere, he converted normal attraction into repulsion. If electricity can alter the gravitational attraction of the bodies used in my experiments, he said, the same force can alter the Earth's attraction if the negative electricity could be drawn from the Earth's surface, gravitational attraction suddenly would cease and the cohesion of the Earth's surface would be disastrously affected. Well, that wouldn't be too good. And there's the cover of uh, Einstein's suppressed work because I can't believe it, they're still teaching in schools and PhD programs that Einstein never completed this. Can you say cover up? I thought you could. Anyway, that's called the einheit lecken feld theory or the unified field theory for gravitation and electricity, which I alluded to at the outset. And there's Thomas Townsend Brown, the uh, American pioneer of electrophysics, born March 18, 1905, Zanesville, Ohio, died October 22, 1985, Avalon, California. Education, California Institute of Technology, also Denison University, uh, National Investigation Committee on Aerial Phenomena was his brainchild, and he was the head of that. Did a lot of really fundamental work on flying disks and sightings all over. Uh, also, this is a very interesting factoid. Between 1947 and 1952, there were more sightings of UFOs, green fireballs, and flying disks in this state of New Mexico than anywhere else in the world. And this is the 50th, uh, I'm sorry, the 70th anniversary of Kenneth Arnold's June 24th, 1947 sighting, famous sighting, coined the term flying saucers, and Roswell, of course, down south here in, in the state of New Mexico. And New Mexico did more to help end World War II in the Europe and the Pacific Theater than any other state in the Union. And there's uh, T. Townsend Brown. And there's the electrokinetic apparatus, U.S. Patent 2949550, that I built. And uh, our friend John Fiala witnessed that in Reno, Nevada in the year 2000 when we demonstrated it with one meter flying devices, the largest since the 1950s. And there's T. Townsend Brown. That's either in France or California. That's the electrokinetic apparatus, electrokinetic apparatus in operation. Uh, see, they're going around the Maypole, and I built that, and it works better than what the patent states. There's a little clearer shot of that. There's T. Townsend Brown in the middle there, and there's a high voltage generator, and there's the pole. So here's your negative, uh, positive pole here. The ship or the craft is negative or chassis ground. And it just chases that point of positivity or uh, bar of positivity into infinity as long as the charge is maintained. And we built this. There's the anode. And uh, we hadn't, I hadn't even seen this picture, but we knew enough about high voltage electricity and electrodynamics to put uh, metal balls on the end to preclude charge leakage. One reason you want these round and smooth as if they're injection molded is because any projections or seams will cause charge leakage, which will rob you of electrokinetic force. 
and there's uh, some plastic insulators and your positive electrode and the ship is the negative electrode and just chases that positive electrode through Coulomb's attraction which of course works in vacuum and that's what they found. In fact they found it works more efficiently in vacuum. You can turn down the current and you get even more force or the same force for less input power. So it's the most efficient propulsion known to humankind on this earth. And there's a uh, propulsion rig in Los Angeles, California in the late 1940s, early 1950s. And we got a lot of interest from uh, the government, newspapers, and of course, Hollywood. And there's a rig for reversing polarity. They found that it reverses polarity and reverses direction instantaneously. So uh, obviously force, uh, the force field cancels inertial mass. Gravitational mass is still there, but uh, we can see from certain works, uh, especially Dr. Gabriel Lippmann discovered that uh, when you charge a body uh, negatively, it has a lot different inertia than if you charge it positively. He called that the inertia of static electricity. Now, this is really important. I hadn't seen this before this year, but I had read about it. This is a science and invention article, Hugo's Gern, Hugo Gernsback's book. This is a gravitator boat. There's the electrode on top for a positive charge and uh, the negative charge ground somewhere on there. But uh, animals and plant passengers on board these boats wouldn't feel any stresses, no matter how sharp a turn this thing would do in the water. And there would be no wake and no backwash. So with this propulsion, it's like you're slipstreaming through any fluid medium, or the fluid medium of the ether if you're in a vacuum. And there they are, in, I guess in California, unpacking the disks after they've been shipped. And there's a gravitator apparatus that's uh, alternating layers of a dielectric and conductor. And those things are really efficient. Those could be used to power ocean liners, just about anything, boats, planes, cars, anything. And why is it moving? Well, you've got your area of maximum potential, your positive charged body. F is force, and you have your polarized body. There's negative, there's positive. Of course, opposites attract, and the force is directed to the side of max potential. And the potential is decreasing in this, in this direction, so that explains why it moves. And then Professor T.T. Uh, T. Brown was experimenting with dielectrics. He found that if you add a dielectric into the, uh, in between the, the capacitor plates instead of an air or vacuum dielectric, you can get far more force. And a couple of the factors that control the force are the high K factor. The higher the K factor, the greater the force. The higher the mass of the dielectric, the greater the force. And by shaping the field, you can get a gradient that increases your force. Very important. And there's what we built that our friend John Fiala saw. That's where we first met in Reno, Nevada. That's where my company is moving us to. I'm going to be running the lab. Uh, it was June 24th of the year 2000. I guess my, my career really started there. I mean, I did my first lecture in 1990 in Colorado Springs at Tesla uh, Convention in Colorado Springs. I wasn't even scheduled, but I said, well, you know, we need to fill up the poster room, so I did a talk there. But anyway, those work even better than what's stated in the patent. And there's the diagram right from the patent. And uh, this is the technology that I am spearheading, well, I'm the head of now. Professor Searle spearheaded it back in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Uh, 1946, the first Searle effect generator was built by, uh, well, directed to be built by then 14-year-old Professor John Searle, who wasn't a professor then, but it was built by the laborers and uh, engineers at British Rewinds and Repairs in London, England. And, uh, that is not only an electrostatic device, it's a gravitomagnetic device. So uh, we have confirmation of unified field. Uh, there's a field coming off the rim that's highly negative, and just like an atom, it's positive in the center. When the generator, which is right around the rim here, is overloaded and superconducting, and the more load you put on the SEG, or STG, spintronic generator, we're calling it now, the faster it runs and the colder it gets until it's icy cold at 4 Kelvin. The Earth's gravity acts like a repelling force and up it goes. And if you don't have these flight cells at the rim to control it, you lose it. And there I am back in 2010 at the Marriott Pyramid North uh, here in Albuquerque with a 1-1 uh, scale model, 10 foot diameter, same size as the P series, P11, P12. And here I'm getting it ready, stayed up all night as it was damaged in shipment from Pennsylvania. That's all styrofoam, all and polystyrene plastic. 
And uh, there are some engineers, I think that's at Banson uh, Labs, Agnew H. Banson Labs in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, uh, same place where Charles Yost publishes the Electric Spacecraft Journal, and I highly recommend, recommend you read that. And there's the diagram. That's a dielectric right there, and you get incredible force with a high K-factor, high mass dielectric with variable resist, a uh, variable, uh, variable amount of dielectric. So you could have more, more conductivity here, less up here, and you get even more force for less input power. And you could get a purely magnetic disk with diamagnetic repulsion with an aluminum disk. This is obviously a German aluminum disk and an electromagnet. These are the lines of etheric force. They're the same on the uh, levity disk, which they used to call back in the day. Uh, we call it an inverse gravity, Searle inverse gravity vehicle now. Now, this is what happens. You have positive space charge in the front while the rest of the ship is charged negative or chassis ground. You get a force. You get a G hill right here. Negative charges are repelling. RCA Labs found in 1958 that negative charges are repelled by a gravitational field. And positive charge attracts. You get a G well right here. So you get a wave. This ship is a wave rider. There's your warp drive. There's your gravitational potential. And there's an inefficient model. You can see uh, in uh, T. Townsend Brown's home lab, uh, uh, home movies from Banson Labs that uh, I got from Sev Bonney way back in 1990 uh, that I met in Colorado Springs after I did my first lecture there in uh, Tesla conference. And there I am in Philadelphia, downtown Center City, with my beam ship Variation 2, which is four foot in diameter, and that's hovering near the ceiling. At the beginning of the talk, I took it off and left it hovering for the entire talk, just giving out ozone. There's the commercial generator, 40 kilovolts, current limited to 1.5 milliamps, and metering for both voltage and current, so I can get accurate readings to maximize the force. And I don't know if this is gonna work, uh, this video, but this is the electrokinetic apparatus in operation. Um, it should play automatically. Let's see if we can get that working. It's not going to play. Anyway, you can see that online if you go to YouTube, type in T.T. Brown Electrokinetic Apparatus with a K. And there's beam ship variation three, the six foot diameter craft. And uh, that is really impressive when it lifts off. And that should start automatically, but for some reason, it's not. It, it works on my laptop okay, though. But you can see that online as well. Anyway, there's your warp drive metric. Now that's in two dimensions, like the rubber sheet, two-dimensional rubber sheet model, but space is in three dimensions. So your craft is going to sit right there, and it just rives that wave of warped space-time into infinity. And the Alcubierre warp drive metric permits the existence of faster-than-light travel within the framework of general relativity. But uh, general relativity has got some problems. However, the uh, the uh, unified field theory for gravitational electricity really corrects some of those problems with relativity. And of course, we can do the same thing with a Searle effect uh, generator based craft. Uh, we call it spintronic generator, Searle effect generator, spintronics. And there should be some animation there that one of our crew did, uh, but uh, it, that's not working. I don't know if we were able to get that working. Uh, but uh, we take a view inside one of the inverse gravity vehicles. And there's my beam shift variation two prototype from 15 years ago, hovering in the apartment. Uh, used inefficient copper wire on the top as the anode. It's just ordinary cheap kitchen foil for the cathode, which would be the body of the ship. And off it goes with uh, very little wattage, probably about a little less than 60 watts if you count for, uh, if you multiply 40, 40 kV times 1.5 milliamps. And there's Otis T. Carr's OTCX1, a flying model, uh, radio controlled. Uh, Ralph Ring, who I met and breakfasted with in Hilversum, Holland, uh, a few years ago at the Global BEM, lectured there, rode in a man version of one of these. And uh, uh, if you've ever seen him speak on television, he talks about uh, basically moving so fast that the human mind can't conceive of it. And it's like uh, Captain Cook when he uh, approached the islands of Fiji back in the day, way, way back in the day, uh, he was talking to the natives and he seemed to, to the natives, 
appear out of nowhere. Only the shaman of the village could see the ships, the tall ships anchored offshore. And then one by one, the villagers could see the ships, the tall ships. And at that point, their culture collapsed. And there's the interior of the OTCX1. That's a utron. It's basically a special shape. It's like a battery. And that passes through these electromagnets, which I think are wound bifilarly. And they're connected in series. Bifilar coils. So another rotor-based design with the rotor. These are actually scalar capacitors because both sides of the capacitors are connected. Both sides of the capacitor plate are connected, positive and negative. So that would be a scalar capacitor. Very interesting design. So it moves through these elect electromagnets creating pulses. And of course the skin is electrified. It's another electrified craft. And you can find these plans online. I first got them from Rex Research and Folios. And there's one of the working models under construction and some of the workers and investors and let's see if we can get this going. Yeah, that's uh, Mark Tamian's design for a uh, electronegative craft that he based on the Searle levity disk, which uh, we now call inverse gravity vehicles because we now know for sure that the vehicle turns gravity into a repelling force instead of an attractive force, and it swims in a sea of electrons. And there's some um, diagrams of the, the rotor base, again, a rotor based system. And the obvious shape to contain the rotor and the shape that best propagates the field is the disc or saucer shape, first reported, I guess, back in the 1940s, but people had reported them earlier than that. They just increased in number as like an invasion in the late 1940s, 70 years ago. And there's uh, my friend and mentor invited me on the team 10 years ago. Professor John Searle, back in 1968-69 uh, period of time when I was a schoolboy. That's the P11. That's a 10, 11-foot diameter device, and it weighs about 12, uh, no, I'm sorry, about four and a half tons. And most of that weight is the generator, the spintronic generator. Now, this is the best thing we have to surviving footage. It's a series of uh, photographs taken in rapid succession with a motor drive camera. The BBC was so interested in this work, uh, BBC One. They would come out every month and the Sunday afternoon flight demos, which are at this field, which you can go to in Warminster, UK. In the 60s and 70s, Warminster was known as the UFO capital of Europe, primarily due to this work. And there's some work on the Demo-1 unit, which was a 21-foot, 7-meter diameter craft. And that weighed 12 tons when it was finished, and it was built in Berkshire on the land of uh, the late Alfred Fleetwood. And there's the control mechanism. It was controlled, radio controlled, with a 12-meter band ham radio. Pretty powerful. It was about the only frequency they could get through because the craft is stealthy. It's radar invisible. You have to have a pinger a transponder, otherwise you will uh, cause great havoc in the air. Anyway, the time tunnel warp drive effect. Pilot Bruce Gernon uh, was in the Bermuda Triangle and uh, he was trying to get above a thunderstorm and he couldn't, went through it and encountered this. Kind of looks like the time tunnel that I used to watch back uh, 50 years ago on ABC every Friday night. But anyway, uh, some strange effects. You can read about that in his book, The Fog, about electronic fog some strange effects. He felt weightless in this thing. And when he came out, he got to his destination about either an hour or a half hour earlier than he should with uh, plenty of fuel still in the tanks. So that is a warp drive and people are now building those uh, versions of those in their garages. Now there's a wormhole presented as if uh, space was 2D instead of 3D, really 4D. There's the throat. Anyway, down you go, and out you come in another region of space-time with uh, hardly any time passage. Now, that's a concept by Dr. Harold White, which utilizes uh, Alcubierre's warp metric. And the negative energy that you need is basically the ether. 
Now, Dr. Harold White, he said, quote, perhaps a Star Trek experience within our lifetime is not such a remote possibility, said White. Working together, the pair envisioned a ship based on Matt Jeffrey's design of the original Star Trek Starship Enterprise. This new design, unironically called Enterprise, is a much more appropriate match for the mathematics behind the Alcubierre warp drive. The theory proposed by McGill Alcubierre in 94 suggested a method which would allow a spacecraft to achieve faster than light travel while adhering to Einstein's theory of relativity. And because in a force field propelled craft, a wave rider craft, there's no inertial mass, gravitational mass is still there, you don't get heavier the faster you go and because of that, there's no time dilation either. So say you go on a round trip to, uh, say, Proxima, Proxima Centauri star group, a four-month four round trip, when you get back, your friends and relatives will be four months older than you. Actually, no, they'll be the same age as you. Strike that. They'll be the same age. They won't be any older. There's no time dilation. So ideal for deep space travel. And there's NASA's electromagnetic propell propellantless propulsion. I was waiting all my life, and in the 80s, I got so frustrated with NASA. They were so conventional. Now they're on board with warp drive. And there is the 7-meter, 12-ton Demo-1. Now, the 7-meter Pleiadian, Pleiarin beam ships only weigh about 2.5 tons. Slightly different technology, but nothing we're not familiar with. There's our friend and mentor, Professor John Roy Robert Searle, still alive and well, living in San Diego. And there's the P-11 on the ground at that same field in Warminster. There's the retractable stairway. So that comes down so the passengers will be far away from the hull because the hull, is even after it lands, before it's discharged, is still carrying a very high voltage. And if you touch that high voltage, uh, it's about, uh, oh gosh, uh, maybe about 10 to the 12th volts, but the current never exceeds 1.5 milliamps. If you touch that, you're dead. So, uh, and then there are the kneeling legs, they're radio controlled also, but non-retractable. And there's a 1972-73 in the uh, woods owned by uh, the late Alfred Fleetwood. And obviously that's a little too small for someone to sit in. It's a little different technology than the Pliarin technology, but the end results are the same. And uh, there they were building it. It was built to completion. There's a flight cell. Now the uh, FAA said, well, what if the motor stops? Uh, what, are, what do you do? Well, this motor doesn't stop. So you have to have these for FAA certification because these not only control the uh, SEG, the spintronic generator, from the outside, they also would act like rudders for aerodynamic flight in case your motor packs up. And uh, there's Professor Searle, gosh, I guess about 45 years ago. And uh, that's uh, William T. Sherwood and his wife Rhoda, who also helped uh, build the craft, wire it up. And William T. Sherwood was at the Rotifer, uh, Madeleine Rotifer UFO sighting and filming, very famous, of an Adamski-type craft in Silver Springs, Maryland, and uh, witnessed that as well. And he was uh, the uh, superintendent of documents for John Searle. And our own John Thomas took over from him. And there's uh, people who, who were uh, volunteers working on the craft. There's Sue, Sue Justice and her husband who uh, flew the craft with 12-meter band ham radio. Now, there's a German diagram of uh, the flight cells which control it. Those are the, the uh, things that act as... Uh, control devices basically to control the generator from the outside. There's comb-shaped electrodes and there are four switches to uh, send electricity out from the rim and uh, you can change the polarity or deny electricity to the rim needles and uh, control the electricity to the upper or lower shells which are electrically isolated. And there's the generator, three ring generator. And there's the basic units called a gyrocell a plate, which is the stator, and the runners, which are the rollers. Searle effect. And that's what happens. Time-varying magnetic fields that travel through the uh, and around the metal jackets will create eddy currents in the metallic layer of the jacket. Because the rollers and plates are in close proximity, electrostatic capacitive charges will develop. 
through continued react reaction and rotation, very high electrostatic potentials will develop and auto rotation will result at a certain threshold level. Now, that's if you build it with the requisite four elements. The demo unit I have out on the table is only two elements, so it's not self-commutating. And there's David Hamill's uh, craft, which has been called the poor man's Searle disk, and he built that after he took a ride on board a UFO. I highly recommend his book, The Granite Man and the Butterfly. The Granite Man and the Butterfly. Highly recommend that. And the cone magnets are aligned above the outer uh, rejection or repulsion magnet so that a lifting force is created. This allows each cone, which are made of aluminum, to carry its own weight. Time, what happened? Whoops, I think I pressed. Oh my goodness. Uh, I don't know, but we, uh, somehow we got off the slideshow. Yeah, yeah, there we go. Yep, that's the, someone uh, constructed that. But uh, anyway, yeah, yeah, there are pods of, of people all over the world who have built these things. Anyway, time is going by. Built that in the 1970s, off it went. Off it went with uh, different color glows as the power level increased. It's a gravitomagnetic drive, which is the same thing as a Searle effect drive. It's working on it, and you can also build a test unit in a coffee can or barrel. It does the same thing. Very high energy electrostatics. Subquantum kinetics, which is by P.A. La Violette. Look at Model G. Model G. Highly recommend that. And these are comparisons to quantum theory and field theory. In conventional physics, special and general relativity are disproven by the Sagnac, Silvertooth, and uh, I guess the uh, uh, other interferometry experiments uh, to detect ether. But the subquantum kinetics, ether concepts supported by Sagnac, Silvertooth, and uh, Michelson Morley. And uh, in conventional uh, relativity, special relativity suffers from the twin clock paradox and the light source velocity paradox. Look those up on Google or Bing search. Subquantum avoids this problem. Classical field theory is plagued by the field particle dualism. Subquantum, subquantum kinetics avoids this problem. Classical field theory suffers from the infinite energy, energy absurdity. Subquantum kinetics avoids that too. Now, uh, I didn't mention that the craft, when it's overloaded and superconducting, well, the generator, when it's overloaded and superconducting, and of course, when you put it inside a craft for control, there's a vacuum around the ship. And that vacuum is coming uh, from a very high po a negative charge coming off the rim, positive charge in the center. So there's your vacuum around the ship, positive charge. There's the center column, positive charge coming out of the center column, while well, the rest of the ship is negative. And these are condensers for attitude control and primary lift as well. And you have static generators, electrostatic generators here. Very simple design. Now there's Edward Billy Meyer with the Pleiadian beam ship and a lady from uh, Pleiades. Uh, looks exactly like Earth humans, except she has, uh, she's, they all have an 800 to 1,000 year lifespan and their IQ starts at about 500 and uh, very, very high spirituality, much higher than uh, Earth people or a lot of other interplanetary races. Now, the tracks are right there, the exact same shape as the landing pads, and the grass is swirled down, and it's like the grass forgot which way gravity is because it continues to grow uh, down for a while, then it comes back. Now we have electricity, magnetism, and gravitation. One side, electromagnetism. On the other side, electrogravitation. And what goes here? Magnetogravitation, as we've seen in the other diagrams. And this is part of a series, of course. This has all been checked by the computer with old and new techniques. And the computer says these are large craft at a distance from the camera. Olympus camera with a focus jammed just sort of infinity because it had been dropped. And if you bought the, any of the beam ship kits uh, that I had here or the beam ship kit videos, I have two left at the table. Um, you can see these flying in motion picture films taken super eight millimeter and 16 millimeter. And this is an experimental ship. And this is, I think, Hassan Bowl in uh, Switzerland. And uh, Billy said, this ship, and you can see in the video, this ship jumps from place to place, up and down. And he said whenever that happens, even though he could be like half a mile away, he got an electrical shock. And there's the beam ship, and you can't really see it in this diagram, 
but that is a Swiss Mirage fighter skirmishing with this thing. As soon as it got close, the ship would just take off straight up until the plane passed, and then it would come back down. So do the governments know about these aliens? I would think so. And there's another film. You can see that also on the beam ship videos. You can also order them from me. You know, take a card, give me a call, and I'll send you a video for like five bucks. I'll, I'll still honor the show, the, the, uh, show price, the uh, convention price. And there's one with a special dome modification to allow time travel. Now, Oleg Jefomenko, if any of you are familiar with his work, he did uh, some corrections to Maxwell's, Maxwell's equations that uh, show that the rise and fall time, the on-off on duty cycle is very important for increasing thrust. You can look that up online too. Electromagnetic waveforms. There's the basic equation for calculating electrovitics, which T.T. Brown came up with. F is force, V is voltage, voltage being the primary factor. M1 is the one electrode, M2 is the other electrode, which would be the surface of the ship, and R squared is the area of your capacitor plates. It doesn't take into account the dielectric you're using. That would be a slightly more complex equation. Now there I am demonstrating beam shape vari variation one, which you've seen out on the table. In Philadelphia, with uh, that same generator that I have out there, a little tiny little thing, weighs 125 grams, and I'm powering it with a uh, battery, which is lithium polymer three cell that you use commonly to propel radio controlled model airplanes or cars. And there I am down at our local flying field in Valley Forge with my beam shift variation one, June 30th, 15 years ago. Now there's a German craft with a Panzer tank cannon. The Germans were doing electrogravitics. Back, uh, back in the day, 75 years ago. There's a craft on the ground with some people standing on the rim and some other people right there. I cannot vouch for the authenticity of this photograph, unfortunately, but an expert can tell. There's Victor Schauberger's repulsing, very important technology. You can read about that online, too. That just uses vortexian implosion action and a falling temperature gradient, just like you see in nature. Victor Schauberger said, copy and comprehend nature. And you can do some incredible stuff, like build starships. I highly recommend this book I bought in 1988 at the convention, Space, Gravity, and the Flying Saucer by Leonard G. Cramp. And also, he has a follow-up, UFOs and Anti-Gravity, Piece for a Jigsaw, Piece for a Jigsaw. Now, this is where we want to get. Gene Roddenberry came up with Star Trek. 51 years, actually 53 years ago, had to pilot the cage. It's primary hull, engineering, warp nacelles, which are B-filled brown giant-sized condensers. There's a starship in, uh, in hyperspace, condition of hyperspace, theoretical hyperspace, or subspace, as they say in Star Trek. They had subspace radio. T.T. Brown, among his other electrogravitic patents, has an electrogravitic communication system which today we would call a scalar wave communication system. Depending on the modulation, it can go slower than the speed of light or at infinite velocity. The speed of gravity, if you research it, is nearly instantaneous. Uh, that would be a scalar wave also. Now, you're basically uh, creating your artificial singularity electromagnetically or purely electrostatically with no moving charge, just sitting there warping space-time. And there's a potential warp field experiment that uh, actually NASA is doing and a few other researchers with interferometry similar to the Michelson-Morley and Silvertooth Sagnac experiments. And there's some more photos from my apartment 15 years ago. This beam ship variation three is so impressive because off it goes, just like uh, Professor Searle's craft, like a, like a rubber ball, he said, bouncing up bounces up like a rubber ball, and then just sits there, hovering and floating around. Very stable. Highly recommend Paul Leavitt's 2008 book, Secrets of Integrated Propulsion. Look at the bibliographical section in there. It's just a tremendous education. Can't recommend it highly enough. Now, Zero Point, the story of Mark McCandlish and the Flux Liner. Mark McCandlish is a Facebook friend who witnessed a craft at Norton Air Force Base that had alternating capacitor plates on the bottom here. And uh, that was a manned craft, manned electrogravitic craft, or we say warp drive craft. Now, of course, Hollywood has some interest because T.T. Brown had an office in Los Angeles. So uh, they copied the high lift profile exactly in The Day the Earth Stood Still, which was one of my favorite science fiction movies. 
or favorite movies, period. And there's the model, as Bob Burns in uh, Hollywood, California. He's a collector of props from Hollywood. Now, we can go from horse and buggy to uh, fuel burning internal combustion to starships, which can go anywhere in our universe. Now, it's Forbidden Planet C-57D Starship. Very interesting main drive. Instead of on the periphery, like the SCG or Spintronic Generator, it's at the center of the craft. And this design was a very ingenious. It was a, a, it's basically a Tesla coil, but instead of an air core, you have a very powerful magnet. I'd say that's a rare earth magnet in the center. And the main drive, which is the magnet, drops down on a spade just before it lands and the landing legs come down. So that's, uh, you know, uh, uh, iron core, basically, and a primary and a secondary, and you're generating all your power you need to drive the craft. And there's what it looks like inside. It's a model kit you can get uh, online, probably. Yeah, the Jupiter II. Now, the Jupiter II is a really ingenious design, too. There's your spintronic generator, and uh, I love the Jupiter II, but for deep space travel and long space mission, Nah, I'd prefer the Enterprise because this would fit in the uh, shuttlecraft bay. Be a little confining. It's just meant to go from one planet to another, and then you just you stay, basically. And there it is, being filmed by the uh, Oscar-winning uh, L.B. Abbott. I highly recommend his book, uh, Special Effects, Wire Tape and Rubber Band. It's about four foot diameter. And they built, of course, a uh, larger version that you could climb into and get out of. That's a full-size prop made of plywood. Coming in for a landing on some uh, planet somewhere. And there it is in the Fox back lot. That's just plywood. Like the Demo-1 model built in, uh, oh gosh, I guess the early 1970s in Berkshire. And there we go. Plywood starships, 1964 to 1972. Both made of plywood, one a full-size TV prop, one an operational prototype. And there's uh, another diagram of the flight cell area at the rim of the craft, cold flame barrier, and the SEG or spintronic generator. And there's the glass SEG, which was built in 1989 in Germany just to show that you could get continuous rotation, some say perpetual motion, with uh, nothing more than permanent magnets. I highly recommend the Lesage Theory of Gravitation by George Louis Lesage, or Lesage Lesage. And uh, this is a correct patterning of what happens. A converging flux of ether. Converging flux of ether is to any massive body. Just like that's two dimensions, there's the three dimensional matrix. Now, Lesage's theory of gravitation is a kinetic theory of gravity originally proposed by Nicolas Fatil de Douillet in 1690 and later by George Louis Lesage in 1748. The theory proposed a mechanical explanation for Newton's gravitational force in terms of streams of tiny unseen particles, which Lesage called ultramundane corpuscles, imparting, impacting all material objects from all directions. So the particles so small to have no detectable mass and basically acting like a river, a river flow current. According to this model, any two material bodies partially shield each other from the impinging corpuscles, resulting in a net imbalance in the pressure exerted by the impact of corpuscles on bodies, tending to drive the bodies together. Now, what does that remind you of? The Casimir effect. And uh, Casimir and Forward developed a battery, free energy battery, based upon that principle with charged foliated conductors. Now, we have the Enterprise, Enterprise, Jupiter 2 here. There's a great ship for evacuating in case your planet catches on fire. And there we are heading out into space at any speed we want. We don't need ballistics and uh, tremendous orbital velocities. We could if we wanted to. We don't have to. We're controlling gravity. We're mastering gravity instead of letting gravity be our master. Really pleasant uh, design of ship for a, a, a family. And the two-meter beamship variation three, we can do interstellar travel, of course. And that was uh, in Switzerland, 1975, seven-meter beamship variation one, one of Billy Meyer's photographs, and of course, it's been all verified. Now, I've done international energy conference, private tech demos, and more. Tesla Club, Philadelphia, 2011, 
and 2014, and it was at Monmouth Regional High School in New Jersey. You've got to teach the kids what they won't teach because they are our future. And there I am on a farm in Chester, Chester Springs, Pennsylvania, uh, just before I flew out to Reno, Nevada to demonstrate these. T.T. Brown, of course. High energy. Oh, let me go back. Go back. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, yeah, the time, the time factor is getting critical. And I still got a few slides to go through. Oh my, yeah. There's the action of the flight cells. That's some nice animation there that one of our team did several years ago. Kind of like a wave motion. Pretty cool. Anyway, back to the slideshow. Uh, oh yeah, there's some nice animation of what uh, the uh, Spintronic generator looks like in operation. Now that's the theoretical laminated version which was never built. All the SEGs were homogeneous. Very cool. It's like a, a magnetized iron atom with all the electrons lined up in the same plane like a solenoid loop. Oh, there we go. That was in Reno, Nevada in the year 2000. I built that. All the parts from that came from Home, Home Depot. <clears throat> we joked that you can build starships by just going to Home Depot. Just a sheet of aluminum, copper tubing. Now, of course, I would just use a thin stainless steel wire as the forward electrode. And it just chases that forward electrode around. Uh, the ship is charged chassis ground or negative. Anyway, that's a Ducrochet disc. That's a mica disc. This is a, a conductive uh, spheres, output spheres from an electrostatic generator. When it's turned on, the disc starts spinning rapidly, and then it just flies off. Very important for educating people about electrovedics. And there's the electrokinetic uh, apparatus, <laughs> but it's, the video's not working on this presentation. But uh, let's see. Um, you can go to YouTube on your smartphone, if you have a smartphone right here or a tablet right here, right now, go to YouTube, TT Brown Electrokinetic Apparatus, and you can see us demonstrating that, supporting my friend Dave's lecture, and I don't know if that's going to work. But anyway, never mind. Yeah, yeah, you, we can come uh, and see it outside. Uh, it was damaged, unfortunately, a little, little bitty accidentally. Uh, I, now I have a sign saying, don't touch it. Do not touch. Warning, danger, Will Robinson. You will get a shock. And it won't feel good. So I guess I'll go to the next slide. Um, oh, wait a minute. Did you get that working? No, nah, I guess not. Anyway time factor is becoming critical. That was animation of a, a ship, T.T. Uh, uh, Brown. I'm sorry, John Searle craft, John Searle inverse gravity vehicle, but that unfortunately is not working. And why is this not advancing? Ah, there we go. Go to the next slide. Next slide. Next slide. It's not advancing. There we go. And there's an inverse gravity vehicle, levity disk around Mars. The gift to mankind from Nikola Tesla, Thomas Townsend Brown. Keep watching the skies. Our home state, my home state, I was born in Pittsburgh, but Pennsylvania this summer is un undergoing a UFO invasion, literally. It's unbelievable. 70 years after, after the fact. So keep watching the skies. Thank you very much. Thank you, Russell Anderson. Oh, and uh, these Spintronic generator uh, brochures from our company. Um, come by our table, check us out, and I'll give you one of these. It talks about the work, and we are seeking qualified investors to support this work because it's for all of you. It's for all of us, not the greed of a few. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much, Russell Anderson. Um, <clears throat> do you guys want to hear the rest of the story tonight, or do you want to hear the story when we come back? Okay, uh, Michael Lees is going to be coming in about 7 o'clock. We're going to be doing dinner and uh, evening social. So, 
Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I thought you asked. I thought I thought you asked, and I didn't see any. Uh, any questions tonight, uh, ladies and gentlemen? Anybody want to talk to Russell? Questions, questions, yeah. questions. Well, I guess they've all been answered. Okay. Excellent. Yeah, that's it. Questions are done.